we just said it was going to be. Mm -hmm. Ooh. I'll tell. Yeah, you're you right. To need to take it out and dump a little bit. Or yeah, I have that idea. Let's see if we just squeeze it right here. Yeah, maybe we'll dunk a little. Wherever. Wherever.
me just uh, remind you that these cases don't go into the quiet room. So we don't get interrupted during our program this morning. And welcome to our program. I'm John Anderson, former faculty member, along with Annie Constantine and many other faculty here, uh, and former president of Alfred State College and currently serving in the role of officer in charge. Before we begin, I'd like to recognize a few people in the audience. Monica Sellis, Tom Galasano's wife and tennis great, is with us today. Caitlin Graham, director of Bailey and Friends, a not-for-profit organization that supports animal welfare in Western New York, and is also Tom's grandniece. She joins us today. Please stand. Mark Zupan, president of Alfred University, is with us. Thank you, Mark. Dale Stell, who's chairman of our Alfred State College Development Fund Board, is with us today as well. I saw him earlier. There he is, right over there. Thank you, Dale. And I know that Mary Huntington was planning on being here. I don't know if she sometimes sneaks in the audience. But Mary Huntington, also Development Fund Board member and the special First Lady of Alfred State College, is with us today. Uh, at the, yes, thank you. At the end of the talk, uh, Tom will entertain some questions uh, from our business students in attendance. And then after that, uh, we'd like our business students to proceed down the hall, and Tom is going to do a book signing in, uh, in the John Shea Hall of Excellence. I want to thank the Alfred State College uh, Community and Continuing Education Training Department for providing free books for our students. Thank you very much, Wendy Dresser Rectenwall. So I've known our speaker, Tom Galasano, for a long time. He is the quintessential entrepreneur. Having a non-conventional idea, he started a company to execute that idea with very little cash, a credit card, part-time employee, and a small office. Oh, and a great deal of persistence. From this very modest beginning, he grew his company, come to be known as Paychex, into the largest payroll and services company for small to medium-sized businesses in the world. Today, Paychex employs nearly 16,000 people and has uh, approximately 700,000 clients and growing. His philanthropic commitments to the community are well known throughout Western New York, Florida, and in the world of Special Olympics. His recent book, Built Not Born is the story of his journey with paychecks, filled with illustrative and often humorous stories and lessons learned. The book is a practical and well-proven approach to starting and or building a business. Definitely a must read. My regret is that I didn't have this book when I was in college. Things may have turned out differently, who knows. It is my honor and privilege to introduce my friend, Alfred State College 1962 alum and 2009 Alfred State College honorary doctorate recipient, Tom Galasano. Thank you, John. Nice job. Thank you, John. One day I get a call from Mr. Anderson, he says to me, Tom on the phone, he says, uh, do you believe in the Constitution, particularly the Bill of Rights, freedom of speech? I said, John, of course I believe in freedom of speech. He says, would you mind giving one? <laughs> I know this is the worst thing you want to hear from me this morning. I got a test for you. You ready? Three men were elected president of the United States. Woodrow Wilson, Dwight Eisenhower, and Jack Kennedy. One of their mothers did not vote for the candidate. Which one? Just think about it. Maybe at the end we'll have a chance to answer the question. Got it? 
three men were elected president. Their mothers didn't vote for one of them. OK, I'm from Rundy Coit, New York, or Rochester, New York. I was in high school a C, C minus student, C plus maybe. Uh, I was really an A plus or B plus student, but I just didn't work at it, didn't take SATs. My family had just gone through bankruptcy, had no money to go to college. My first job, counting money in the vault of a bank, large department stores used to bring in cash deposits. That's when we had department stores downtown. And my job was to take a package of money, usually 50 bills, count them, make sure they were all facing the same way, that was the exact number, and they weren't mutilated. I did that, I put my stamp on the package, and I did the next one. Now, here I am, an 18-year-old young man doing that in the basement of a bank. It wasn't a lot of fun, and I learned a lot really quick. And of course, the first thing I learned was I better go to school. I chose uh, Alfred Tech, took the business management program, two years, really enjoyed it. The reason I really enjoyed it, 95 or 90% 90 of my classes had to do with the business environment, and not so much with sort of liberal arts courses. Not that I have anything against liberal arts courses, just I enjoyed the business courses more. Got to know Mr. Thomas Dunn. Mr. Thomas Dunn is a former employee of Alfred State Tech, taught accounting here for decades. He was my favorite instructor, we became friends, He's now 90 years old. I still stay in touch with him. Uh, and he taught me more about public accounting or accounting in general than any other person. He encouraged me to go to Albany State Teachers College, come back and possibly become an instructor here at Alfred. I applied, got accepted, saw my curriculum, all liberal arts. I said no, went out and started working. Over that period, well, let me talk a little bit about my stay at Alfred Tech first. Biggest difference between now and then, uh, to give you the year 1960 to 62, biggest difference, guess what? No tuition. State paid for it all. All you had to do was supply your room and board. Now, some politicians, of course, are trying to work their way back to that environment. They're not having much luck, but I thought you'd be curious in the fact that uh, I didn't have to pay it. I guess you guys are paying it. Stated Robinson Chapman. Robinson Chapman, dorm. I had a car. It wasn't much of a car, but it was enough of a car to get to the Beacon. The Beacon was the bar down the road when Alfred Village was a dry town. So roommates in the dormitory looked to me to drive them down to the Beacon every night Around 7 o'clock, they'd meet me at my car. Then I'd come and get them about 10.30. And they paid me about a buck a piece. But it was enough for me to buy gas money for my car. I said I was a C plus or C minus student in high school. I did make the dean's list the first year, and I believe the second year. I just, I knew why I was here. I worked a year at a bank, counting money, and I saved all my pennies to be able to come to Alfred Tech. I'll tell you one story that uh, still sticks with me. I had a friend, I'm gonna call him Ron, that was his name, I'm not gonna tell you his last name. Ron was from Rochester, great guy. He was dapper, he was funny, he was good looking. Women did like Ron. Three weeks before graduation, he and the young lady, a young lady went to a hotel or motel and spent the night. Ron and the young lady were thrown out of school and weren't allowed to graduate three weeks before graduation. Now, if that had happened today, which I don't think it would happen today because our attitude towards those types of things are much different, uh, nothing would have happened. But I wish I had done or tried to do something about that. Because that young lady and that guy spent a lot of time and a lot of money and effort. And to have that happen to him in the end for something that today 
would be considered silly. Okay, John mentioned Paychex. What is Paychex? Paychex is a provider of payroll processing services and human resource services. We operate all over the United States and some countries in Europe. Our average client size, number of employees, is 14. If you were to go to the library, a library, and research how many businesses fall in certain size range, you'll find that 95% of companies have less than 50 employees in the United States of America. 95% uh, 50, 50 employees or less. <coughs> I started a, on a horseshoe, but to give you an idea, John gave you some of it. We do have over 700,000 clients. We produce over 14 million W-2s every year end. We have 16,000 employees, 4,500 of them in Rochester. Our average revenue per year is over $4 billion. <clears throat> Our market valuation. Everybody know what the term market valuation means? Multiply outstanding shares of stock towards the stock price. And that will give you the market value of the company. <clears throat> Our market value today is $4.2 billion. We've done 10 three to two stock splits. $10,000 invested in 1983, it would be worth about six or eight million dollars today. <clears throat> Not rubbing it in, I just thought you'd like to know. <laughs> now, believe it, believe me, when I started this endeavor, I had no idea what it was going to turn into. What really happened, our growth came in plateaus. We would set a goal, achieve it, set the next goal, try to achieve that. The services you've probably, have any of you ever received a paycheck with our name on it? Just a few of you, huh? I'll have to get to work on that. If you are an employer in the state of New York and you have five employees, you have a minimum of 42 payroll tax returns, returns and payments that must be made to the federal and state government every year. 42 tax returns and payments. If you don't do them correctly, in other words, if they're late or the wrong amounts, you are subject to fine and fines and penalties, and they're quite severe. That's a pretty rough job for a small company with only five employees. Normally, they don't have anybody on their staff that really understands payroll processing and payroll tax laws. Now, there were other payroll processors when I started. <clears throat> I worked for one called EAS in Rochester, New York. They were after traditional, much larger companies, 50, 100 employees and more. Their idea was the more the employees, the better prospect and the better client that, the, that they would be. Everybody in the payroll processing business in 1971 when I started was always focused on large companies. We had to be unique. Did three things. First of all, the larger companies used to have to fill out computer input forms to get their payroll processed. Those forms then had to be delivered to the payroll processor, the payroll processed, and then returned back. We had the idea, let's have our clients call in on the telephone. For a five-man payroll or a 15-person payroll, heck, you can do that in two or three minutes. And the client doesn't have to learn how to do anything, much less fill out computer input forms. So that was uh, issue number one. Second one, tax returns. Remember I mentioned the 42 payroll tax returns and payments? Let's do them for the client. All the client has to do is sign them and send them in by mail. And three, price it so small companies could afford it. Minimum charge for doing a five-person payroll by traditional payroll processors back then was like $25 every pay period, like every week or every other week. We priced it at about $5 for the entire five-person payroll, much less expensive and more affordable. Plateau number one. Remember I said plateaus? Limited ambition, limited startup resources. 
My goal was to get 300 clients in Rochester, New York. It took me five years to get 300 clients in Rochester, New York. Guess what? We now sell 2,000 a week. Now, that's not a reflection of my sales ability that it took me so long. But the fact is, with our sales organization that we have today, we signed up 2,000 new companies every week. John said we started with meager. He's right. I had $3,000. That's how much money. And by the way, I was married with two children. Uh, sent the, spent the $3,000 on direct mail. Thought if I could send out that amount of direct mail, that I'd get enough responses, that I could make enough sales, that I could uh, be at uh, break even. I wanted 60 clients from that direct mail campaign. I got six. So <clears throat> from that point on, it was like beg, borrow, and maybe a little bit of that other thing to survive. We did survive. Slept in the computer room at night. I was the only computer operator. That's all I could afford. Friends would buy me lunch and dinner. Fortunately, I had some good friends. But I survived four years. And then one day, a friend of mine came into my door and said, Tom, it looks like this thing is going to work for you. He says, yeah, well, we're getting there. It's a tough, tough road. He says, I'd like to get involved. I said, well, what are you talking about? He says, well, I'd like to be an owner. His name was Phil. I said, Phil, how would you feel about starting the company in Syracuse, New York, and then moving to Buffalo, and then maybe Albany? And we'll do it as a partner, as partners. Phil said, I like that. We invested the equal amount of money, and uh, he ran and managed the Buffalo, Albany, Syracuse uh, location. A few months later, an employee of a client walked in and said, Tom, this service is great. He says, how can I get involved? I says, are you willing to move? And he said, yeah, I'm willing to move. I says, where would you like to go? He said, Miami, Florida. I said, oh. Well, Chuck, uh, I think I'd like to be your partner in a Miami, Florida operation. He says, no, I don't want to be your partner, Tom. He says, I want to be your franchisee. Wow, that was a new thought. Let's see, set up money, uh, payment on revenue over a period of time, and I don't have to do much for him after, once he gets started. Sounded like a good idea. So I said, okay, we got the lawyers together didn't have a franchise agreement. First lesson, and I talk about it in the book uh, significantly. First lesson, watch the lawyers. These lawyers spent hours drumming on these tiny little details, running the bill up. And Chuck and I got just as frustrated, or he got just as frustrated as I did. Finally, I said, why don't you guys leave? They left. We put the agreement together in 10 minutes. And Chuck went on to be our Miami franchisee. I said, now what a great way maybe to become a national organization. Here comes plateau number two. For the next four years, I brought in 17 different people to become either partners or franchisees. I was making a presentation in Naples, Florida several years ago. And during the Q&A, a woman raised her hand and asked me, Tom, you did really well with those paychecks. How many people did you have to step on go going up the corporate ladder? Of course, I resented the question right away. But my answer was this. I didn't step on anybody. I brought a lot of them with me. I'm talking about the 17 and then all the people that uh, attained positions and uh, did well successfully financially through stock options and bonus programs. Well, <clears throat> the general characteristics of these people is interesting, though. First of all, they were willing to move from Rochester. And uh, so I had to just sell them during January and February when it was easy. Of course, I remember that walk from Robinson Chapman down the hill up to the university where the business department was in zero degree weather and 30 mile an hour winds Oh, I can't tell you how much I hated the school then. <laughs> uh, 
I'm going to interject here for a second. Uh, the book you are taking home, I hope, and we'll get around to reading, there's a message in there that I felt very strongly about. There's a common feeling or attitude that people that go into business are big risk takers. And you've got to be willing to take a big risk to go into business. Well, let me say something in contrast to that. Don't you think it's risky working for a company these days? Uh, most excellent example is Rochester, New York, Eastman Kodak. 1982, Eastman Kodak six, had 62,000 employees. Today, they have 4,500 employees. You, as an employee of a company, could do a bang-up job, a really good job. But if your boss does lousy, where is it going to get you? Or you and your boss do well, and the department does poorly. Where is that going to get you? You, your boss, your department do well, but the company doesn't. Where is the security in that? So I make the argument, and I stand on it, that risk working for a company can be or is more risky than working for yourself as an entrepreneur. There's some other aspects to it, too, and that is if you work for somebody, you can't sell your job. You can't give it to an heir, a son, a daughter, a niece, or a nephew. And if you become physically or mentally disabled, you're really going to be in tough shape. So when it comes to risk, please keep that in mind. Those of you that even today, I know you're very young, may be thinking about starting the business or being involved in the business as an entrepreneur. Remember those facts. Uh, these guys, they disliked large companies. Uh, they started with borrowed money, supported themselves on twelve to 15000 a year. That doesn't even make the uh, current uh, minimum wage, does it? They were young, average age, 28 to 30. They were aggressive and determined. High degree of integrity, trusted them all. Varied backgrounds, most had never touched a computer and knew nothing about payroll. Their backgrounds included engineering, teaching, various sales jobs. One guy, his last job was the doorman at the Boca Raton, Florida Hotel and Club, which some of you probably know it's an exclusive club down in Boca Raton. He was the doorman. What we used to say about him is if he, even if he failed, it would be a step up. But I can tell you, he didn't fail. He moved to Los Angeles, California, and uh, did a very great job. I married a girl from the university in 1962, my senior year. We lived in Wellsville for the last quarter of uh, my uh, second year. In the book, I talk about prenuptial agreements. That's all I'm going to say about it. Read it in the book. <laughs> I think it's important that everybody read it. Uh, <laughs> Okay, great. Now we got these 17 franchisees and partners. We're all having a good time. We meet twice a year in a nice spot. Everybody's fairly successful financially. Boy, this is awkward, though. How does one walk away from an agreement like this? I didn't, certainly didn't have the funds to buy them out, and they didn't have the funds to buy out my share in their company. We came up with an idea. Let's take these 17 companies, 18 companies now with mine, and consolidate them into one company. The reasons? Skill matching. Some of the people were excellent in sales and poor in operations, and some the opposite, good in operations but poor in sales. The financial strength of each of these little companies uh, just was very, very weak. One thing that also surprised me at the time was the ambition levels began to vary. He had some guys that couldn't wait to open their second and third territories, you know, additional cities. And some guys had no interest at all. So that means certain territories, certain cities were not going to be covered. And the big thing, big thing, 
about being an entrepreneur is how do you walk away from it someday? How do you get eventual liquidity? Do you sell it? Do you give it to an heir? Do you take it public? So you have options, but they're not easily uh, attained. When we brought them all together into one consolidated company, <coughs> they elected me president, which I was immensely thankful for. But now I had 17 vice presidents reporting to me. Can you imagine that? It was worse than a bank. Or maybe a university, I don't know. <coughs> I had some guys that had some real ego problems. Their business card used to say President, Paycheck, Cincinnati, Ohio. And now it says Regional Manager. Secondly, we had to have management reports now that compared branches. We wanted to know who was doing better, who was doing worse, who was getting the job done, and who wasn't. That created issues. Also, I couldn't have 17 people report to me, plus a, a, a chief financial officer and an HR person. So I had to promote three out of the 17. You can imagine how the ones that didn't get promoted felt about that action. They used to be drinking buddies, and now all of a sudden they're reporting to them, and they have to supply management reports. We had a five-year strategy. We were either going to take the company public, or we were going to sell it. We were going to focus on more branches, more salespeople for the first three years. And there's years four and five. We were going to focus on profitability to make our company worth more in dollars. It wasn't easy. We had to borrow money after we consolidated into one company. Uh, it was a Rochester bank. They classified our loan. That doesn't mean we were okay for civil defense or something like that, and that we probably wouldn't be able to pay the loan back. But we did. We didn't get paid for six months, the 18 officers or 20 of us. At the time, we were doing about eight to 10 million in revenue. Then something happened. We get a call from automatic data processing. How many of you heard of ADP? Uh, probably more than have heard of Paychex, I guess. Anyway. <clears throat> They want to buy us. I said, that's interesting. Just to have somebody say they want to do that was wonderful for morale. Our people loved it. Geez, we might be worth something. Um, they made us an offer of $20 million. It was cash, but we were doing eight to 10 million at the time. It was cash, but years two and three, we had to reach certain goals. It's called an earnout. I don't recommend earnouts. They're very easily gotten in, get into negotiation and confrontation and adversity. So they offered us the $20 million, but we had to reach certain goals years two and three. To me, that's responsibility without authority. You've got to achieve something but you don't have the capability or the uh, right to determine how you're specifically going to do it. So we became a public company, 1983. Remember I said ADP offered us $20 million? How's that compared to $42 billion? It does compare, you know. Where are the, where are the 18 people now? I was the first one in, I was the last one out. Uh, several of them have passed away. It's been a number of years, obviously. Uh, some of them went into payroll processing business in other cities, which was fine with us. That certainly was their right to do it. Most of them wanted to become, to go back to their entrepreneurish days where they were the number one person. Some of them thought we should run a sheltered workshop for them which means they don't have much responsibility and they still get paid well. That wasn't going to happen. The payroll processing business has changed a lot. 
Right now, human resource products or services are approaching 50% of our revenue. Now, we didn't start human resource products servicing until the middle 1990s, 25 years later when we started payroll. But now it has become almost half of our revenue. It includes things like making the actual payments for the employer to the federal and state governments, uh, check signing, 401k administration. Those pension plans, we service over 100,000 companies, 401k pension plans. Employee handbooks, cafeteria plans, electronic time attendance, time and attendance, so forth. Employee leasing. Fortunately, also, for payroll processors, the federal and state government continue to make it more cumbersome, more complicated, and more just the effort it takes. Things like COBRA and TEFRA and ERISA, 401k, electronic tax filing, new hire reporting. None of these probably mean anything to you today unless you've been involved in a small business or your family has been. But it's not easy being an employer in the United States of America. You're actually an unpaid tax collector. We have 700,000 plus clients. ADP has about the same number, maybe a little more. Guess what? You add our client bases together, we don't have 15% of the entire market for payroll processing. In other words, we're 50 years old, we have about 7.5% and they have about the same. So it's still a wide open market for anybody that wants to get into. I'm not advising it. <laughs> we had a simple philosophy. This philosophy shouldn't be any surprise to anybody in this room. For your customers, your clients, you got to pr provide outstanding value. People pay for it with their hard earned money. They want to think that they get something for it. Employees, employees are looking for career opportunity, financial reward, job satisfaction. Naturally, if you're going to want to have happy employees, you must provide those three things. Although I got in trouble when I owned the hockey team. We had a saying, I had a saying around paychecks. We didn't have employee contracts. But I had a saying, if you do a good job today, you could come in tomorrow. You could report to work tomorrow. Well, I'll tell you, hockey players have multi-year contracts, and their agents and lawyers just hated me for saying that. In fact, the press crucified me. But hockey's a different sport than, than business, and obviously that's the way they operated. Your shareholders, people that own your company, what do they deserve? They deserve a competitive rate of return. They invest their hard earned money, they want something for it. So your management responsibilities serve your three masters, clients, employees, and shareholders. Anybody get the question about the mother or the president? Come on, nobody? Anybody want to take a guess? What? Why? No, very weak answer. <laughs> you older guys here? Well, John knows, but he's heard me ask this question before. When was Wilson elected? Approximately, 19... 16, 14, 16, I think. Women couldn't vote. <laughs> uh, anybody interested in what I'm doing now, besides me? I retired as CEO from Paychex in 2004. 
I was 63 years old, I guess, something like that. And uh, John accused me of being an entrepreneur, almost uh, just about entrepreneur. Since then, I've invested in about 25 different companies. Took my resources that I made from paychecks and used it to invest in companies. You might have heard of the Buffalo Sabres. Yeah, the hockey team. Do any of you watch hockey? <laughs> okay. Um, owned them for uh, eight seasons, nine years. Bought them out of bankruptcy. Uh, the owner of the, of the Sabres was a family by the name of Regus, and they were, had a public company in the uh, cable TV business, and they got into trouble. Uh, operating their public company like it was their own personal company. And consequently, father and son went to jail. Uh, and we bought the team from them out of bankruptcy. Um, turned out to be a very uh, good investment. When we bought the team, we had uh, 5,000 season ticket holders. Uh, when we sold the team, we had about 16,500 season ticket holders with a waiting list. Uh, we took the team from uh, being in the cellar to uh, one year we won the President's Cup, two years we went to the semifinals for the Stanley Cup. Uh, the President's Cup is the best winning season of all 30 teams. Uh, we decided to sell the team. One of, our, one of my partners, the managing partner, Larry Quinn, was developing heart trouble. So we decided it was time to sell the team. He was a very intense person. I just didn't think it was the best thing for his health to, to uh, be part of it. Also ran for governor. If you want an education, you do that. Um, ran as an independent. That's a tough road to hoe in American politics. The Republican and Democratic Party has such a tough hold on those types of positions. Some people have said to me many times, though, that involved in politics, consider yourself fortunate you didn't win because it is a tough road. And you can see, just think about New York, most of you are New Yorkers, right? Think about New York State. Two governors forced to resign, Spitzer and Cuomo. The Speaker of the New York State Senate, three of them, ended up in prison. The speaker for the New York State Assembly ended up in prison. And the controller of the state ended up in prison. What is going on? You think how bizarre that is? Fortunately, we got a good organization running SUNY, right? <laughs> At least this one. And I have also gotten involved in philanthropy. Uh, fortunately, um, with uh, the resources that I've earned from paychecks, I've been able to support many organizations, particularly ones that deal with individuals with uh, developmental disabilities. Uh, the Special Olympics is probably the biggest receiver of our uh, contribution, and we're very, very proud of that. Some of the businesses I've invested in, too, you might be interested. How many of you have heard of uh, Greenlight? Uh, a few hands. Greenlight is an internet service based in Rochester, New York. Uh, we just acquired a company in Binghamton. We are opening up Buffalo, uh, just started in Buffalo. And uh, we have a waiting list of people waiting for the internet service, 10,000 in Rochester, New York. We did a press release in Buffalo, and within 10 days, we had 12,000 people wanting to get the service. I don't, I don't want to mention the other competitor, but obviously there's a lot of people that just don't like them and are looking for another answer. Um, give you, if you want to hear a couple of versions of some of the things we do. Uh, we have a company that sells automobile warranties on used cars. 
some of you probably have gotten, or your parents have gotten phone calls in the middle of dinner trying to sell you a warranty program on your car. Well, we do it totally different. We sell it through the car dealers. The car dealer salesperson actually make the sale for us, and we handle the financing. That's going very well. Uh, company, has anybody ever heard the company of, uh, called Quick, uh, Quick Start? Yeah, you're nodding your head. Quick Start provides initial financing for the starting of new businesses. And you provide that financing through the uh, internet. Go on their website, and you see what's available for investment, and you can put a small, small amounts of money towards that company. We have a company called Kick Further, which specializes in companies that need financing for inventories, like a ski shop. They buy a lot of inventory in the summertime, and they have to pay for it by a certain date. We provide the financing for that. It allows them to get large discounts from their manufacturers. We have a company that uh, manufactures a device for people that have to have spine surgery. You fuse vertebrae in the spine, and you do it with the use of screws, actually. And the placement of those screws is extremely, extremely important. And we've built a, created a device and software to go with it to provide that to doctors that do spinal cord injury or repair. OK, I guess we're there. Uh, welcome all kinds of questions, personal and non-personal. Yes, sir. Uh, ethical challenges are a reality. You're going to have them. And generally speaking, they're the toughest things to resolve uh, because people have different levels of what they consider to be realistic and fair. Uh, my attitude was whenever you get one of those problems, deal with it as soon as you can. Because if you let it go, it's going to fester and fester and fester. And instead of having one person unhappy, you're going to have at least two unhappy. Um, CEOs got to make decisions, too, uh, relative to integrity and reality. Uh, a lot of them have to do in the area of pricing their products. So it's a tightrope you have to walk as a uh, CEO or as a manager. But it's very important you deal with them as soon as you can. Yes, sir. I'm sorry? I naturally wanted to make an impact. And I thought the way to make the biggest impact was through the governorship. I'm not quite sure I, I believe that today. Sometimes the speakers of the legislatures have more oomph than the governor does. But I wanted to make an impact. And I thought I could. And I still think I could, could have. But obviously, running as an independent in a place like New York State, you just don't have a prayer. Yes, sir. Ma'am. What gets you motivated at the start of your first business? We realized we had a huge marketplace with 12 million businesses under 50 employees in the United States. What a target. And nobody seemed to have the, uh, I wouldn't say wherewithal, because they certainly would have the wherewithal, but the oomph to go after that market like we did. And it was just taking advantage of that opportunity. 
that uh, really kept us going. And, you know, we wanted to be successful. It was more fun being successful than not. You've heard that? <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Sir, I. What's your philanthropy style and which one happened and which is your cause? Uh, philanthropy style, I guess we have a style, right, Kaylin? <coughs> People submit uh, applications to us. We want them to be in a fairly narrow range of working with people with developmental disabilities. Sometimes we vary from that. Um, we have a team of people that visit the uh, applicant, the organization. Uh, we do things like check their accounting records, making sure everybody's being paid fairly, um, that things don't, that they have a legitimate use for the money, and that they're not going to waste it or are just applying for for something because they think they can get it. Once in a while, that happens. So we're very disciplined and structured in who we give the money to. And they have to go through a good application process. Yes, sir. So I use so-called philosophy of discovery management. Whether you're selecting people like Carol, but also uh, you can tell exactly how much you're talking to why you're doing it. So over your experience, and would you consider yourself more of a thought leader or should I just rank you? Say the last two again. Uh, I like to think most entrepreneurs are creators. And we saw a need, and we created the uh, answer to that need. Uh, entrepreneurs are really problem solvers. They see a problem and say, we can do that better than somebody else is doing it now. And that's kind of what uh, would distinguish us. Yes, ma'am. Excuse me, I can't hear you. Yeah. We want everybody to hear the question, too. What avenues as a young person should I start with to begin an investment career? You know, that there's a different answer for every person that has that question, basically. Um, if you can determine an area of expertise or an area of vocation that will make you happy and you enjoy doing it and you would spend your good amount of your time pursuing it, by all means do it if you can find that. And I think uh, that's the $64 question for everybody. You guys are going to spend a couple years here, and uh, you're going to have to make some decisions. You may have already made some based on the uh, curriculum you've chosen. Hey, are you a fan of cryptocurrency? I don't understand it, and it scares me. <laughs> I guess I'm just too old school. I just don't get it. How many people get it? I know a few people raised their hand. Yeah. Didn't somebody else over here? Um, could you speak to their medical centers that you have helped establish? Sure. Um, I think she's referring to uh, Golisano Children's Hospital in Rochester, in Syracuse, and now in Fort Myers, Florida. We've also done some things in the area of autism and mental health. And I guess those are considered health issues. Uh, the, it is the most rewarding thing in the world to be able to help those hospitals. Uh, I don't go by a week if somebody doesn't come up to me and tell me how thankful they are, the fact that these institutions did 
exist and how well they do. In fact, I had one today. So we're very proud of them. And hopefully we can do more someday. But they're expensive. <laughs> yes, sir. My biggest a, fa a failure? Oh, that's easy. Uh, when you're dealing with Wall Street, you walk on eggs. And one of the ways you walk on eggs is Wall Street analysts do not like CEOs getting into businesses they know nothing about. They think they know something about it, but they don't. One year after, within a year of the day we went public, we started a company similar to what you think of as Monster.com, only it was before the internet. Monster.com is the recruiting company, right? We started it. We thought, geez, we know employers, et cetera, et cetera. And it failed miserably. Monster came along later and made a success of it because they had the availability of the internet. That was the biggest one. And here they knocked our stock down. And took a, it took a while for it to recuperate. Now, I just want to thank you for coming today. I enjoy doing this. Please enjoy the book. Um, I hope you enjoy the book. It's got some real good stuff in it. <laughs> Think so? Yeah. Sure.